Nothing else matters to a mortgage specialist. Brawl. The Jill Dando murder case. A new witness says she saw the killer. Britain's spies are still listed on the internet tonight despite all the government can do. Good evening. The United Nations Human Rights Commissioner Mary Robinson has been to Belgrade and accused the Serbs of vicious violations in Kosovo. She also criticised NATO for the civilians being killed by the bombing campaign. The Serbs say they've started to withdraw their troops from Kosovo, but NATO says it's a lie. There's no sign of any serious withdrawal. The BBC's John Simpson is in Belgrade. His reports are being monitored by the Serb authorities. The bombing continues as heavily as ever. This was Serbia's second city, Novi Sad, last night. Belgrade has mostly escaped since the mistaken attack on the Chinese embassy five nights ago, but other towns and cities are still enduring heavy bombing. Nish is one of them. Yesterday, Mary Robinson, the UN Human Rights Commissioner, went there and saw for herself the aftermath of an attack which had taken place a short time earlier. One or more NATO cluster bombs, which can have a devastating effect on human beings, had gone astray, showering the centre of the city with deadly canisters, not all of which exploded. At a press conference this morning, Mrs Robinson showed her concern about the effects of the bombing, but she balanced it with a powerful condemnation of ethnic cleansing. She'd hoped to be able to put this to President Milosevic himself, but he refused to see her. I have to conclude that there must have been some reason why President Milosevic did not wish to meet me, because I certainly wished to meet him. I think one of the question marks, and it's not for me to answer, I'm not a military expert, but if you have purely an air campaign, to what extent more are you exposing civilians? Because it's not focused on preparing for um, uh, a land campaign, for um, uh, actual fighting by soldiers. Why is it that civilians are so much the innocent victims in the meantime, some of the forces who are accused of driving ethnic Albanians out of Kosovo have been filmed leaving the province themselves. The Yugoslav government says it's withdrawing the majority of its forces from Kosovo, but these pictures are the only evidence so far, and there can be no certainty yet that it's really happening to any serious extent. John Simpson, BBC News, Belgrade. Ethnic Albanians who fled from Kosovo into Macedonia say there's no sign that Serb forces are withdrawing. Some say they've seen reinforcements arriving. It's now estimated by the United Nations that 230,000 ethnic Albanians have taken refuge in Macedonia. From there, Orla Gerin. Hardly able to walk, this weakened old woman had no choice but to struggle on. For weeks she has been fleeing Today, finally, she and 50 others crossed the border into Macedonia. There was no rejoicing. They were exhausted and still afraid. These people fled villages in central and southern Kosovo. They say the Serbs are not pulling out, but digging in. The general information that I've got over the past days is that there's no, no sign of military retreat. Um, in fact, people actually, a new military has been, uh, has been brought in. Um, New wagons have been seen carrying uh, military on it. From the border, they were brought to the chaos of a refugee camp. But for three-year-old Ermal, there was a rare treat and a new sense of security. Those who fled in fear, like Chamile, told me Serb soldiers are still on every corner in Kosovo. I don't think we will ever be able to go back home. The soldiers are everywhere and they are never going to leave. They are inside every empty house. Most believe the Serbs will never go. The war is behind them, but for many, like her, life will never be the same again. They've lost home and homeland, and here they are simply not wanted. After their long ordeal, this is the end of their journey, at least for now. They're joining the masses in the heat and dust of a tent city. It's a place no one would ever choose to call home. 
Orla Guerin, BBC News, Stankovac Camp, Macedonia. The latest refugees arriving in Albania have brought with them yet more stories of Serb atrocities. Some 5,000 have crossed the border in the last few days. Many say they've heard evidence of more massacres. The 9 o'clock news special correspondent Ben Brown in Kukesh has been following human rights investigators, hoping one day to help bring those responsible to justice. Along the Kosovo border today, NATO's bombardment of Serbian positions was unrelenting. But if and when NATO do finally win this war, it will of course be too late for those hundreds, perhaps thousands, that are said to have been massacred by the Serbs. Yeah, these people arrived too early to be witnesses of what happened because it happened only 10 days ago. Andre Lomen is a human rights investigator in search of refugees who may have witnessed atrocities before they fled from Kosovo. He sees himself as a detective working on one of the great crimes of the century. And he says he's uncovered evidence of a recent massacre of young men in a village in Kosovo called Studimia Epime. They were encountered by Serb forces who basically went tractor by tractor by tractor, uh, demanding money from people, beating a couple of people up, and those people who didn't have money, in several cases, uh, got executed at the spot. I mean, we've heard people saying that they saw 30, 60, 70 dead bodies lying on the road. I interviewed several people who saw people being shot in front of their eyes. I met one of those who says he survived this massacre, Bashkim Ademi. He told me he was shot in the leg by the Serbs and then had to watch his brother being murdered. They took my brother off the tractor, he says, and shot him dead. Then they shot my uncle too. He took this ring off his dead brother's finger, all he has now to remember him by. Among the refugees who've just come out of Kosovo, one has brought fresh evidence about another and earlier alleged massacre, this time in the village of Maya. He doesn't want us to show his face. Doctors, he says, lined the men up and took blood from their arms to go into the Serbian blood bank. The men began staggering around, he claims. They were so weak once the blood had been taken from them. Then they were rounded up into a group and shot with machine guns. Finally, the Serbs poured petrol over the bodies and set fire to them. Human rights investigators here are recording the stories of individual refugees in meticulous and painstaking detail. No one knows whether the Serbs responsible for what's alleged to have happened inside Kosovo will ever be put on trial. But if they are, there'll be no shortage of eyewitness evidence to use against them. Ben Brown, BBC News, Kukes in Northern Albania. Boris Yeltsin has told the French President Jacques Chirac that Russia will stop trying to find a diplomatic solution to the Kosovo conflict if NATO continues to ignore its proposals. But as Mr Yeltsin tried to strengthen his position with the West, the Russian Parliament began debating a motion on whether to impeach him and remove him from office. From Moscow, Rob Parsons reports. Boris Yeltsin didn't look like a man fighting for his political life. It was business as usual today, including a meeting with French President Jacques Chirac, here to discuss Moscow's efforts to negotiate a peace settlement in Yugoslavia. President Yeltsin was in combative mood. If NATO continued to ignore Russia's proposals, he said, Moscow might abandon its attempt to mediate. <laughs> But the concern in the alliance is that it's internal political turmoil that might undermine Russia's peace mission. Boris Yeltsin's opponents are baying for his impeachment, a process that would lead to his removal from office. Impeachment! Impeachment! In the state Duma, Russia's lower house of parliament, deputies began a debate on impeachment that culminates in a vote on Saturday. Confrontation with President Yeltsin is just around the corner. The dry submission of the charges belied the underlying tension. Brought to boiling point yesterday by Mr Yeltsin's decision to sack his popular Prime Minister, Yevgeny Primakov. Yeltsin's evil actions destroyed the economy of Russia, our technological base and our state security. He did this deliberately. Political paralysis looms large once more, just as Russia had begun to send a modicum of stability. A little down the river from the Kremlin, 
the Red October Chocolate Factory fears the worst for the future. Profits have been swelling and production increasing as consumers turned away from expensive foreign goods in favor of old Soviet-era favorites like Mishka the Bear. Now Kremlin intrigue threatens to undermine the economy and send the currency spinning into another whirl of inflation. What Russian manufacturers need today is stability, so we can be sure of the future. The big danger now is that instability will put up the cost of raw materials. It makes us very nervous indeed. What Russians are asking now is why Boris Yeltsin has chosen this moment to plunge Russia into uncertainty yet again. What most people here crave more than anything else is stability. It's something that's been denied them ever since the breakup of the Soviet Union. Robert Parsons, BBC News, Moscow. Here, there have been more developments today in the Jill Dando murder case. A new witness has come forward. Police have also confirmed that they're examining photographs of Jill outside her home, which were sent to a laboratory for developing. And there's now a reward of £150,000 for anyone who helps to solve the case. The latest witness to come forward said she drove into a parking space outside the TV presenter's home. It was the day Jill Dando was murdered. Fifteen minutes before the crime, the woman saw a man acting suspiciously, but the description was vague. Today, detectives <coughs> admitted they still had few leads, but with so many sightings, they needed to establish if the presenter was the target of a professional killer. It's vitally important that we eliminate these people in Gowan Avenue, because once we've eliminated them, we can determine <coughs> were they lookouts? Was this a man acting alone? Was this a, a larger organization to, to kill Miss Dando? This is the face of the prime suspect. All that's known about him is that he was seen sweating at a bus stop near Jill Dando's home. He caught the number 74 to Putney Bridge Underground Station in London, but there detectives admit the trail goes cold. The police deny the inquiry is beginning to founder because there's still much to investigate. But the officer in charge of the investigation is now second in command. A more senior detective has taken over. Tonight, Scotland Yard is examining photographs of Jill Dando found here in Devon, but they're not thought to add much to the investigation. What may is a substantial reward from a newspaper and a businessman. Officers need a breakthrough to find the TV presenter's killer. Stephen Cape, BBC News, Fulham. We've just heard that Cheshire police have arrested the parents of Louise Woodward following an investigation into allegations of fraud. It's understood to be in connection with the appeal fund set up for the former au pair when she was on trial in the United States. Gary and Sue Woodward were arrested a week ago and have now been released on bail. The names of more than a hundred British intelligence officers were still available on the internet this evening, even though the Foreign Office thought they'd been removed. The media have been urged not to publish the address of the website or the information it contains. The list was allegedly put on the net by a former MI6 officer, Richard Tomlinson. This is Richard Tomlinson, the disaffected former intelligence officer who is suspected of breaking the Official Secrets Act by publishing the names of MI6 staff. He's thought to have sent out a list of names by email. The Foreign Secretary said that not all the names on the list were connected with the intelligence service. Nevertheless, the release of any such list, however inaccurate it may be, is a deeply irresponsible and dangerous act. I regret that Mr. Tomlinson appears to nurse an irrational and deep-seated sense of grievance. Richard Tomlinson told BBC News that his website didn't contain any names. That was broadly true. They appeared on a different part of the internet. Attempts to keep them secret inevitably failed. Eight o'clock tonight, and a Foreign Office spokesman is quoted as saying that the website appears to have been closed down, but it's not. BBC News has found it, we're not going to show you where it is, and we've told the authorities the internet address. It contains a list of more than 100 names of MI6 officers, some even with dates of birth and details of their posting. It all goes to show how difficult it is to block information once it's been published on the internet. This episode has been described as a serious piece of damage to the intelligence service, though not a mortal blow. MI6 is trying to limit the damage, although it looks now as if the names of its officers will soon be widely known.
Joshua Rosenberg, BBC News. The Home Secretary, Jack Straw, has admitted that details of the inquiry into the murder of the black teenager Stephen Lawrence were probably leaked by someone in the government. Extracts from the report were published in a Sunday newspaper three days before its official release. An internal investigation has failed to identify who did it. Cherie Booth and Hillary Clinton joined speakers at a conference in London today to call for greater legal rights for children. Cherie Booth shared, chaired the event, which was organised by the charity Childline. Mrs Clinton appealed for more protection to be given to children worldwide. Labour's Donald Dewar has been elected as the first minister of the new Scottish Parliament. Liberal Democrat support meant he had a comfortable majority over the SNP leader, Alex Salmond. And tonight, Liberal Democrat members of the Scottish Parliament have overwhelmingly approved a power-sharing agreement with Labour. Our constitutional affairs correspondent John Pienaar reports from Edinburgh. Labour salutes the First Minister of Scotland. Now it's official. Scotland has a parliament, a political leader, but so far no administration for Donald Dewar to lead. Tonight, Mr Dewar was all magnanimity. He'd agreed the basis of a coalition pact with the Liberal Democrat leadership, and he at least was having no talk of a Lib Dem climb down. Good agreements are agreements from which both sides get satisfaction and advantage, and I think that's what we have here. But of course I haven't heard what the Liberal Democrats are finally saying, so we will have to wait and see. But for Jim Wallace, it hasn't been as easy as that. He's saying nothing tonight, and he's still trying to persuade sceptics in his party that they've won a deal worth having. The Lib Dems wanted to abolish college tuition fees. Their leader is backing the compromise of an independent review. But will his party be able to reject its findings? The final story is still being written and rewritten by the media. Labour says no. Both sides of the coalition would be forced to toe the same line. Some Lib Dems won't take no for an answer. I will never, ever compromise on tuition fees. Right? It's as simple as that. Earlier today, the two parties were sticking together and everyone joined in the applause. Donald Dewar was elected on Labour and Liberal Democrat votes. Cooperation is always possible where there are common aims and values, even there may be other areas where there are great and dividing differences. But his rivals all complained of a political stitch-up. Alex Salmond of the SNP, the Tory leader David McCletchy joined in the chorus, and so did Dennis Canavan, the member who was expelled by Labour and won his seat anyway. His congratulations left Mr Dewar looking just a little uncomfortable. It was left to Jim Wallace to offer a tentative hand of friendship. In his remarks, Mr Dewar said that he looked forward to working closely with colleagues, depending on what my colleagues, my colleagues and his colleagues decide, perhaps later today, that working relationship uh, may be very close indeed. And tonight, the party hierarchy is meeting to approve the deal. They're expected to say yes, but behind closed doors, some are saying the Liberal Democrats may have sold their support too cheaply. John Pienaar, BBC News, Edinburgh. There's growing pressure on the government tonight to reconsider its planned changes to benefits for the disabled. They'd beat smaller payments for thousands of people in future. So far, 61 Labour MPs have declared their opposition to the plans, and many leading charities have resigned from a government advisory panel in protest. Labour rebels emerged today after a meeting with the Social Security Secretary. The minister was listening but not moving. The MPs left empty-handed. I mean, it was a private meeting, so I won't come into the details, but there is no evidence that the government is yet proposing to change its mind. Um, we'll therefore carry on making the case that uh, a very large number of backbenchers, and particularly millions of disabled people up and down the country, are looking to the government to you know, take our arguments seriously and to reconsider their position. Much of this row centres around the one and a half million people like Alan Street who receive incapacity benefit. Alan has multiple sclerosis. On top of his benefit, he has an occupational pension from his time as a teacher. The government wants to take that into account by introducing a means test. It won't apply to existing claimants like Alan, but it does mean that in future, the better off will receive less. I'm not a wealthy man, but I would be considerably poorer under this legislation. And I think for many people, they will have to look in terms of um, what will go? Will it be the holiday, for example? Or how will they find this sort of sum of money? Or will they look to the charitable organisations? At the charity scope, they believe the proposals will penalise those who have saved. And it's not clear that the, the people whose benefits they're cutting are going to get back into work anyway. Along with 11 other disability organisations, they've just resigned from a government advisory group. 
furious that ministers have thrown out their suggestions. We took 300 ideas into the Benefits Forum and they were all rejected. And I think given the government's inclusiveness in other areas, we'd have hoped for something better on this. The Social Security Secretary, though, has come out fighting. Many of his welfare reforms have been welcomed, especially the extra help for those with more severe disabilities. He's not about to apologise for cracking down on incapacity benefit. It's the right thing to do, it's a balanced package, it's fair, it puts the benefit system on a modern footing. These proposals are justified and the government intends to stick by them. So no backing down? No. The next round in this tussle will come on Monday when MPs vote on the Welfare Reform Bill. But if backbenchers and disability groups hope that they'll manage to change ministerial minds, they're likely to be disappointed. The government has made it clear that on this one, ministers are not for turning. Neil Dixon, BBC News, at the disability charity Scope. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is fighting for his political life ahead of Monday's general election. Mr Netanyahu's right-wing coalition is trailing in the opinion polls to the Labour opposition, led by Ehud Barak. But the Prime Minister has fought a vigorous campaign and no one's ruling out the possibility of a last-minute surge in his support. Bibi, king of Israel. But after three years in power, is Benjamin Netanyahu's crown slipping? Looking confident is the Prime Minister's stock in trade, but opinion polls paint a dismal picture. Fighting for the same turf, chief rival Ehud Barak is running an effective campaign. With a promise to unite a fractious nation, the uncharismatic Mr Barak knows this election isn't really about him. It's all about Bibi, a referendum on three years of deadlocked peace process, a declining economy, social and ethnic divisions. It's a negative campaign that has never been here before. You wouldn't hear anything like this on Shimon Peres, let alone Rabin, that it's kind of delegitimizing the prime minister. In campaign commercials, the Prime Minister's opponents show a man dancing to the tune of right-wing and religious allies. Hitting back, Mr Netanyahu controversially reminds Israelis of the suicide bombs that preceded elections three years ago and shows how terrorism has declined under his leadership. Almost absent from the campaign debate, any discussion of the peace process. The Netanyahu government has presided over a rapid expansion of Jewish settlements. New outposts have sprung up throughout the West Bank in recent months. Benjamin Netanyahu's supporters seem confident. Ehud Barak may be stretching his lead in the polls, but it hardly seems to matter. In 1996, Mr Netanyahu was never ahead in the polls, and he won. Tonight, Israelis celebrated their victory over the Arabs in 1967. The two leading candidates have vowed never to redivide Jerusalem. The future of this city, Jewish settlements, the question of a Palestinian state. Israel's next prime minister, whoever he is, will have his hands full dealing with the peace process. But he must also find a way to unite his own people, something Benjamin Netanyahu has failed to do. Paul Adams, BBC News, Jerusalem. The 9 o'clock news has found out that the scientists who cloned Dolly the sheep are now cloning pigs so their organs can be transplanted into humans. They're expecting the first cloned piglet to be born by the end of the year. Our science reporter Palab Ghosh has this exclusive report. When Dolly the cloned sheep was born, many doubted whether she'd survive. Three years on, she's a mum, but her long-term legacy could be a new generation of medicine. The scientist who created Dolly is now trying to clone a new breed of genetically engineered pig whose organs can be used in people. They're using pigs because their organs are similar to humans. The importance of pigs is that they are considered to be the most likely species to provide organs like hearts and kidneys to transfer into human patients because as I'm sure you're aware there's a great shortage of organs to transfer into patients and people are dying for the lack of an organ from a suitable human donor. Organs from pigs would normally be rejected by a human patient. To stop this from happening, the researchers here are genetically engineering pig cells, these slightly dark patches. They first add chemicals to them and then pass an electric current through. 
Their aim is to knock out some of the genes that cause the rejection. The next stage is to make a clone from this now genetically engineered cell. This new cell is then put inside an empty pig egg. It's given another small electric shock and a tiny cloned embryo is created. If all goes well, the embryo develops into a piglet. These pigs are among the first in the world to be carrying a cloned embryo, but their offspring is unlikely to be born because the technique hasn't yet been perfected. But the researchers here hope to produce the first cloned pig by the end of the year. The eventual aim is to grow human cells like these in the lab. The researchers are working with a US firm to find ways of turning a cell taken from a person into spare body parts. One possible treatment would be to grow bone marrow cells for people with leukaemia. What we hope to be able to do is to be able to take a skin cell from a patient suffering such a disease and reprogram it so that it becomes bone marrow cells that you can use uh, for your own transplant. The first cloned pigs are just a few months away. Their birth will mark a new phase in the use of cloning technology to treat people. Critics, though, will argue that this use of animals is a step too far. Palab Ghosh, BBC News, at the Rosslyn Institute in Edinburgh. And the main news again tonight. The UN's Human Rights Commissioner, Mary Robinson, has accused the Serbs to their faces of vicious violations. They say they're pulling their troops out of Kosovo. NATO says there's no serious withdrawal. That's it. That's all from the 9 o'clock news. Good night. I'm afraid we've blown their cover on the internet, but we make no apology for it. If you want to know who they are, log on to www.bbc.co.uk forward slash question time, and you'll find full details on Margaret Beckett, Michael Howard, Ming Campbell, Bishop Nazir Ali, and Melanie Phillips. Or watch them tonight at 5 to 11. A murder investigation is underway after a man was pushed off a station platform into the path of a train. It happened at Hatch End Station in North London. Police say a 40-year-old man has been arrested. Buckinghamshire Education...